Hey there, my name's Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now you've probably heard of the word Linux. You know it's an operating system. In fact, it's the kernel that's used at the heart of the Android operating system. It also runs on a wide range of devices, including desktops and laptops. It's at the heart of Chrome OS. You can get it on servers. It even runs on the Raspberry Pi. Now you may have also heard of Unix. And of course they sound similar, Linux, Linux and Unix. And you may be wondering, are they the same thing? Are they compatible? Uh, are they completely different? So if you want to know what is the difference between Unix and Linux, please let me explain. Okay, to understand the difference between these two operating systems, we need to know a bit about the history of how we got to where we are today. So let's start with Unix. So Unix was invented by two men, that is Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. Now you may have heard those two names before. Dennis Ritchie, of course, is famous for inventing the C programming language. And if you have a copy of the C programming language, the book by Brian Kernighan and Dennis Ritchie, Kernighan and Ritchie, and it's often called the KR version of the C language. And then there is Ken Thompson, and he is very famous for not only inventing uh, Lit Unix, Unix, but he also invented the uh, UTF-8 character encoding that we use all the time today, and he is the co-inventor of Google's Go language. So here we're dealing with kind of legends in computing. So in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, Ritchie and Thompson, along with people like Kernighan, were working on an operating system called Multix, and that's the Multiplexed Information Computer Services. And that was an operating system that was designed to run multiple programs at the same time. Now the team got frustrated with the direction and the scope of the project, and so in their spare time, Thompson and Ritchie started working on an alternative. Now at the beginning, this alternative only could run one program at a time. So rather than being called Multix, it kind of got nicknamed as Unix, where the U part was for uniplexed. And you can see what happened from here. That was spelling was with a C S at the end, but over time, and no one can remember why, not even Kernighan, not Ritchie, Thompson, but over time, that got changed to Unix with an X at the end, and hence the Unix operating system was born. Now it was written first of all in the early 1970s and by 1972, the C programming language, which Kernighan and Ritchie were developing, had become sufficiently mature that they were able to rewrite the operating system in just C. Now another interesting thing is at the time, AT&T were forbidden from entering into the computer market due to some uh, previous legal problems they had with monopolies. And so therefore, all AT&T could do was license the source code for this new operating system. And that's exactly what they did. And it started being used in various universities around the country. And one of the universities where the new operating system arrived was at the University of California in Berkeley. Now over time, AT&T actually separated itself from Bell Labs and it was able now to enter into the computer market. So by the early 80s, it had actually started to sell a commercial version of its Unix operating system. And this commonly became known as System 5. And there's a whole reason for that to do with different versions that came before it, but it was called System 5. Now at the same time, the people at Berkeley were also continuing to develop the Unix uh, sources that they got way back when AT&T were licensing the sources. And this led to a flavor of Unix called the BSD version because it's from the Berkeley software distribution. And so by the mid 80s, you've now got two versions of Unix running. You've got System 5 from AT&T itself and you've got BSD from California. Now from these two branches, various important and well-known versions of Unix were spawned. For example, HP UX and Solaris come from the System 5 kind of inheritance and uh, operating systems like Alteryx, which was from uh, DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, uh, came from the BSD line. Now, of course, over time, the various different things that were being developed in these two operating systems were cross-ported. The most important one was that networking, first of all, came to the BSD distribution, and eventually that made its way over into System 5. Now, of course, all this source code is still under the source code license that came from AT&T when they originally sold it to the various universities. So over time, the BSD version started to replace the files that came from AT&T with their own version. So it became separated from the System five version. Eventually the University of California decided to release publicly the source code for its version of the operating system and it said it was free from all AT&T files. Of course there was a lawsuit and we're now in the early 90s. You've got the University of California versus AT&T and ultimately the lawsuit was dropped. 
And what came out of that process was a version called BSD 4.4 Lite, which is meant to be a version of Unix which has no uh, source files that originally came from AT&T. Now this version of BSD then went on to create what we have today which is FreeBSD and various other operating systems including in part Mac OS which we'll talk about in a moment. Now the upshot of all this is that two important things happened. One is that we now have a defined Unix philosophy. So the idea of you write one program and it does one thing really well. The idea that a program, its output, could become the input to another program, which is the idea of pipes. The idea of how you compile programs and the, how the command line works. This has all been defined because of System 5 and because of BSD. And the other thing that happened is that they wanted compatibility between the versions, so there started to be published a range of standards, the most popular one being POSIX, which actually says that if your program is to compile on this operating system, it has to have these APIs that have these particular functions. So you've got the POSIX specification, which really defines what Unix does from a programming point of view. Now while all this was going on, there are several other things that were happening in parallel that we need to know about. One is the, the start of the GNU Foundation, GNU standing for GNU's not Unix, which of course is recursive because then to go back into GNU you say GNU's not Unix, GNU's not Unix. And that was started by Richard Stallman and he is responsible for the ideas of free software, not free as in no cost, but free as in freedom that we have today. And also he was responsible for making sure there was the GNU C compiler, the GNU uh, C runtime library, and lots and lots of other tools that were used to, able to be able to build a free version of Unix without relying on the BSD files or relying on the AT&T files. And also it's worth mentioning there was another operating system called Minix which was written by Andrew Tannenbaum and he was using this as an educational tool to teach students the fundamentals of operating system design. So you've got System 5, BSD which has been released publicly, you've got Minix and you've got the GNU tools. So in Finland in the early 1990s, there was a student at university called Linus Torvalds. And he had used Minux and he knew about uh, Unix and he wanted to overcome the, the deficiencies that he saw in Minux and write his own operating system. And he did that and published it, announced it to the world. Now there's a key couple of things about this uh, announcement. First of all, it ran on PCs, that's 386 PCs. So we're not dealing with mainframes, we're not dealing with supercomputers, we're dealing with something that maybe students can have in their house. And that actually made it accessible to many people who were interested in doing OS development. The other thing to note is, of course, we've got all the tools that came from the GNU project. So you've got the compiler and the shell and all the things you need that came over from GNU and they were being able to be used by uh, Linus to actually create the Linux kernel. And also at the time that he actually published his announcement, the Linux kernel was completely free of all Minix code. And of course, when Linux was developed, it was developed using the same philosophy and the same model as the Unix philosophy and the Unix programming environment that came out of System 5 and BSD. And quickly it gained support, it gained a lot of interest, and it really started to take off when in 1992 the X windowing system was ported over to the Linux kernel, which means you could now have a desktop with windows, you could open up multiple terminals, and people really started to use it. And that's when I got on board. I first used Linux when it was about version 0.98, I think. We downloaded it at university and we started using it on our PCs at home to see what we could do with it. And one other key thing is before we got to version one of Linux, it had started using the GPL, that's the GNU public license that came with the uh, free software philosophy from the GNU Foundation. So now you have this open source free software that everybody's able to contribute to. And now you wind fast forward to today and we can see that Linux is absolutely everywhere. So the popularity of Linux is undisputed. It runs at the heart of the Android operating systems. That means literally there are millions of people every day who are using Linux. You've got it on servers. 60% of the web servers on the internet are using Linux. And of course, you've got it in things like Chrome OS and so on. But to that end, Linux isn't a version of Unix. It's a clone of Unix. Or today they like to call it Unix-like because Unix was actually a product sold by AT&T through its its System 5 branch and it was an operating system developed uh, from Berkeley University. So Linux is, doesn't use that source code but it uses that philosophy. It's a clone, it's Unix-like. 
So where are we today? Well, obviously Linux is still used uh, in many, many places and uh, BSD, those BSD source codes kind of morphed into FreeBSD, which you can download and install on a PC even today. And through various different kind of uh, merges and workings, you'll find parts of it even actually in Mac OS through Next Step and then down into the new version of uh, Mac OS, which uh, Steve Jobs kicked off once he returned to the company. So in that end, actually, you'll find that the most popular version of Unix used today is actually Mac OS. So before I made this video, I had a quick search through the whole Linux uh, development tree, and you can still find references back to Unix in the tree. In two particular cases, one is in some files, it will mention that the file originally came from uh, Unix, and however, it's now been rewritten and changed to be completely open source code. And in second place, there are many, many interfaces, many, many ways that things work, the philosophy of Unix that you still find in Linux. And so therefore, there are various labels and various things that are tagged as Unix. Unix because actually that was the way that Unix did it and so that's the way that Linux does it. Now I wanted to see how well this uh, has stood up to history so I found some source code to Ultrix 4.3 which is a version of the BSD uh, Unix that DEC released in the mid 80s and I took one of the files in there in this particular one it was backgammon a, a terminal version of backgammon and then I copied the source file over onto my Raspberry Pi and then I tried compiling it to see whether it would work now there were some differences in how the C compiler works today it took me about five minutes to fix those and then voila I had a version of uh, backgammon running on my Raspberry Pi from an original version of the source code that was released well, how long ago is that? 30 years ago, and it still works because Linux is a Unix clone, and the Unix we had then and the Unix, Linux that we have now, they are very, very highly compatible. Of course, that's source code compatible. Binary compatibility is a whole different story. There are some binary compatibility layers between various versions of Linux and FreeBSD and so on, but let's not worry about that. Now, just to clarify a couple of things at the end here, of course, a Linux distribution, so we're talking like, you know, uh, Red Hat or Fedora or uh, Ubuntu or Arch or whatever your favorite version of Linux distribution is, includes much more than just the Linux kernel. Of course, you've got a whole bunch of tools like, you know, the KDE desktop and the GNOME desktop and things like LibreOffice and Chrome and Firefox and all these things that are included. And that's absolutely fine. And at the heart of it is the Linux kernel. And FreeBSD is the same. If you get a FreeBSD distribution, it comes with the FreeBSD kernel, which is based on the source code that was released by BSD 4.4 Lite. But then on top of that, you've got the desktop and applications like Firefox and so on that are actually part of the greater ecosystem of free software. Okay, so in summary, Unix is actually a product that was sold by AT&T as a commercial product. Its source code was licensed in the early days, which means eventually we had some of the source code out in the public and that was used for operating systems like FreeBSD and to some extent operating systems like Mac OS, which we have today. Linux was written using Minix as a way of writing a Unix clone or a Unix-like operating system. And today it doesn't share any files with the original versions of Unix from back in the 70s and 80s. And ultimately free software has won the day here because of course Linux is so popular, not only on servers, but also on uh, smartphones. So my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. If you've got any questions about Unix and Linux, please ask me in the comments below and I'll try my best to reply. You know what else I'm going to ask you to do? Please subscribe and please share this video on social media. Okay, well, that's about it. So I'll see you in the next one.